Today on a jam-packed episode 54 of Rail Talk, we break down the Jim Dandy and the three-year-old picture, look forward to a huge Whitney weekend and the sale up at Saratoga, and much, much more. I'm Joe Bianca. I'm an ownership advisor at West Point Thoroughbreds, and today is the last day of July. Training camps are open. Football is right around the corner. John's got his Giants hat on accordingly. And John, we got to figure out another bet for this year between the Jets and the Giants. I know you're too scared to come to Brooklyn again, so we had we got to come up with a new idea. Is is the bet to see who's better, the Giants or the Jets, or how many snaps Aaron Rodgers actually gets? Shut up! Shut up! Don't say it again. I swear I will come to you and strangle you in your sleep if you put the kibosh on Aaron Rodgers' Achilles again. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable and just general antagonist of Joe Bianca, co-host on this wonderful podcast. Joe, we have racing. We have sales. We have football, training camp. We have baseball coming to uh, you know to, to its uh, annual close uh, and the pennant race. If you're not excited about waking up in the morning the uh, on the last day of July, first couple of days of August, then you just shouldn't wake up. Ouch. Real talk is sponsored by Basic Tipton. We are right around the corner right now. Less than a week away from the Facing Tipton Select Yearling Sale in Saratoga Springs, right across the street from the racetrack. It'll be next Monday and Tuesday, August 5th and 6th. Sessions start at 6.30 each night. If you haven't been, you definitely got to check it out if you're in the area. It's free to the public. Uh, if you want to sit in the pavilion, you need you need tickets, but it's free to come in and roam around, have a drink or two, watch the horses come back and forth, watch the horses go into the ring. It's unlike any other sale atmosphere in the United States, and obviously the quality is through the roof. And I also want to mention the following week, we've got the New York Bread Yearling Sale, very near and dear to my heart, August 11th and 12th. Uh, on Sunday, August 11th, it's after the races. The session starts at 7 p.m. with 100 hips, and then the following day starts at 12 o'clock with another 200 hips. John's got the catalogs. He's already got the printed catalogs because he's an old man. He doesn't know how to use an iPad or a laptop, but those are very, very snazzy. John, tell us about what you've seen so far from the catalogs. Well, Joe, what I didn't realize until until I started going through the catalog is that this is the 103rd Saratoga sale, select Saratoga sale. And it seems like every year it just gets better and better. And, and uh, the breeders are bringing, you know, higher and higher level horses here. But it's the number one ranked yearling sale in percentage of grade one winners. Did you know that? I didn't I didn't realize that they're the number one in, mm -hmm. in terms of grade. So if you want a grade one winner come here. If you don't want a grade one winner, you can still come here. But there's, you know, if you want a grade one winner, that's where you, that's where you're going to get. You have Sierra Leone, National Treasure, Seize the Gray, and Prince of Monaco adorning the cover. Um, there's over 300 horses that are being sold, including, oh, you know, just a candy ride and American Pharaoh and a ghost zapper that, that we're selling. And there's like 300 other horses, but mostly, you know, our, ours that are, that are in there, they're being sold through Taylor, Taylor made. made. And then the following week, you know, just when you think the party's over, it's not. You have the New York bread sale, um, which, again, get chock full of uh, New York bread champions. And you can look on the count on the uh, catalog. and You see all the champions that have that have occurred. But, you know, Joe, you have American Pharaoh, Audible, Authentic, Bolt Dioro, um, Cupid, your favorite, your favorite stallion. Cupid has has a New York bread in here. Gunrunner has a few hard spun Independence Hall, Improbable. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Again, another 250 or so of the best New York breads that the, the Empire State has to offer here at the New York bread sale, the 11th and the 12th. Um, you don't necessarily need tickets to get in for seats for the New York bread. You just have to be willing to sit on somebody else's lap. <laughs> Look for John. That's where I always sit. So fabulous, fabulous edition of the Jim Dandy on Saturday at Saratoga. Six horse field, but stacked from top to bottom, and there was a great stretch run between Fierceness and Sierra Leone, and it was great to see Fierceness step back up, run his race, prove that two-year-old champion form again because he's been a bit of an in-and-outer. And I got to say, it was great to see Mike Rapoli and his team celebrating so much in the boxes. You, know, you can say what you want about Mike, but the enthusiasm that he has mm -hmm. for the game 
is undeniable. And I love that, you know, he's won some of the biggest races in the world. Jim Danny's obviously a big race, but not as big as some of the other races he's won. And he still celebrates like it's the Kentucky Derby or like it's the Breeders' Cup Classic. And I'm sure there was a, it was a, I think it was a really vindicating win for him and for Todd Pletcher because Fierceness had gotten some criticism from, you know, among other sources, this show for being a little faint hearted, a little gutless. And I think that that was what, was so great about the ride that Johnny Velasquez had aboard him was he took him out on purpose, turning for home, mm -hmm. basically said, Sierra Leone, if you're going to come get me, you got to come up the inside, which is harder to close on the inside than outside of horses. It was great to see him back. Sierra Leone, again, ran a great race, but again, leaves themselves too much to do. The Travers, John, is stacking up like a monster, monster race. Torpedo, Anna, potentially Fierceness, Sierra Leone, Mindframe, Doorknock, Unmatched Wisdom. Like, these are really, really nice three-year-old horses. And I'll, I'll make a broader point about the three-year-old crop in a minute. But uh, what was your takeaway from the Jim Dandy? Well, it, it was it was typical Fierceness being Fierceness. It was, uh, you know, when, he, when he's on his game, he's one of the best horses of his crop. And when he's not, he's he's not. Um, he he runs numbers that basically would be lucky to win an A, other than uh, in, in you know in in the winter of New York. Um, but in his pattern, this was the on again, off again, on again, off again, on again um, fierceness. And he ran a 103 buyer, uh, and and really looked like a dominant three year old. Um, you know, again, he's only run half a dozen now seven times. Um, so his his career is still. Uh, you know, unwritten as far as what else he'll be doing down the road. He champion two year old um, inconsistency has riddled his his performance. But, Joe, I agree with what you're saying, because not only about about Mike, Mike has the enthusiasm of of a fan and shows it and and definitely gets excited when horses run well and he's running a bunch of races. And the Jim Dandy, even though it's a grade two, it is an important race in New York racing landscape. And knowing, you know, Mike growing up in in uh you know as a fan of of new york racing um this i'm sure was really super important the other thing is you got to remember this is a homebred of theirs so it's not just a horse that they purchased and is you know competing in grade one and grade twos and the toughest uh races for straight three-year-olds so far this calendar year um but it's the fact that he actually bred the horse adds a little bit additional of excitement pride of ownership um and, and i can tell you if you own a horse and you're camp and you're competing in those races and win. That's one thing. When you're a breeder of it, it's even better. So I, I can't imagine having a horse of this caliber um, winning these kind of races as a homebred. Sierra Leone, Leone also ran a typical Sierra Leone race, which was he was out of it until he wasn't. Came storming back, um, and then unlike previous times where he's been the antagonist going after literally going after a, a horse that's in front of him batten down actually pinned him to the rail um batten down was the one who was who was coming down and, and being hit right-handed by by junior alvarado um to the point where he was pinning sierra leone against the rail some would say that that caused sierra leone um uh, you know to miss a beat and to pause and maybe not have his momentum going forward all the way i don't think it mattered i think the way that that johnny v um who now has ridden this horse fierceness five times and understands his quirkiness. I think he did like, the right thing and had him going down the middle of the racetrack and basically gave himself a wide berth um, to show that the horse was the best. I was a little disappointed with Seize the Gray. This is the second straight race that he has not shown up um, after his uh, Preakness win. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's a, but that's that's the three year old year. You know, the three year old calendar is you're going against the best horses of, of your generation. And um, that horse has run a dozen times already, which is a bit much for a three-year-old, even in the Lucas camp. Yeah, no doubt. And I, it was just one of those things where as soon as you saw how far he off the pace he was, yeah. you figured like he was not going to run his race. Um, so he's had, a, he's had a, a great campaign and might need a little bit of a break. But uh, we talked about it. It was a thrilling triple crown season. And it's it, it has seamlessly moved into a thrilling summer with the Haskell and the Jim Dandy so far and the Travers shaping up to be a phenomenal race. And that's the point I want to make is – Hear me now and hear me good. Like, this is a very, very nice three-year-old crop. Like, there really, honestly, is nothing else you can set your watch to in racing quite like people complaining about the weakness of the three-year-old Colts <laughs> after the Triple Crown. Like, it happens every single year. You could resurrect Secretariat, Seattle Slough affirmed, and you'd still have the same chorus of whiny bitches, excuse my language, Len, talking all summer about how mediocre the three-year-old class is, and I'm, I'm over it. Like, and it stops now. This is a good 
group of three-year-olds, competitive, talented, classy, good-looking, everything you could want. And does it have any Hall of Famers? Maybe, maybe not. You know, the time will tell. But the fact that the two-year-old champion who won a grade one earlier this year by 13 and a half lengths had to win the Jim Danny to prove himself among his class, I think tells you all you need to know about the strength of this three-year-old crop. So please, like for the first year ever, can we appreciate this class of sophomores, Phillies included? Well, and, and Joe, and just to add to your point, look at this upcoming weekend's racing um, with the Saratoga Derby, the grade one, and and the test um, for three-year-old Phillies, you know, also a grade one. There are some really solid, salty horses in both those races. Um, and again, three-year-olds. So maybe not even so much that the three-year-old, uh, three-year-olds that are running, you know, two turns on the dirt that are that are good, which you mentioned, you know, they they had so many um, individual grade one winners in that three-year-old crop. But just look at the turf racing and and the female sprint racing, um, and and again, you can come up with with a few more horses that are definitely worthy of talking about about how solid and how wonderful and quite frankly you know, how much I would like to have one or two of them in my barn. And, you know, I'm sure you guys would feel the same. But, yeah, this three-year-old crop is really salty, at least at the top end. Um, there's there's a lot of good ones. You know, I, I always think about this, especially in years when the older male division isn't that strong. And we, we're going to talk about the Whitney, which is, you know, stacked race relative to what's out there in the older dirt male division, 12 horses in there. But I always, I, I always wish there was like a future bet you could make, like just – either a three-year-old or an older horse to win the classic. Cause I feel like most years you would get pretty good odds on the three-year-olds this year. I would be heavy betting a three-year-old would win the classic. There's a couple other horses over the weekend that we want to talk about. How about the chosen Vron? Like the cool, one of the coolest horses in racing. I think he's right up there with next and maybe a, a few other select horses ran a one Oh five buyer winning the Bing Crosby for the second straight year. He's just a horse that shows up every time. Cal bread, obviously, by Vronsky and what is he like 19 for 24 yeah, now in his career I mean he's 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 just a machine and really really one of the horses to admire out there in California uh silver knot romping in the bowling green that was a really impressive race because they set some pretty fast fractions considering they were going a mile and three eighths and we had Ohana honor in the race and I thought Kendrick did the right thing like he kind of went after him early to try to win the race because God knows we see enough turf races in New York where everyone's riding for second and just let somebody crawl on the lead. Kendrick went for it, didn't turn out too well, but that's just because Silver Knot is so good. And yet another Charlie Appleby monster. Nakatomi won the Alfred G. Vanderbilt handicap. Another really, really nice race. Ran with a 105 buyer for Wesley Ward. And I got to give a shout out to my favorite Philly. I know I'm supposed, not supposed to have favorites, but she's my favorite Philly in the West Point stable, in the West Point universe. Don't look back at all. Getting her first graded stakes win in the caress on Thursday. Patty, I'm going to send you some video of the West Point partners celebrating, watching the race. It's awesome. It's everything that you could possibly want to be if you start to get involved in horses, to have that feeling, to be rooting amongst all your friends and your coworkers and your family for a horse that just tries hard every time. She's run first six times, second five times in 13 career races. races. Pennsylvania bred by Peace and Justice, the definition of an overachiever, and she richly, richly deserved that win. I was so, so happy to see it. And, you know, she got a 94 buyer, so she's not far off with top, some of the top Philly turf sprinters are running. So me mega shout-out to the Clement team and to Don't Look Back at All, who's just as solid as they come. John, what else What else stood out to you from the rest of the racing this weekend? Well, Silver Knot, uh, you know, so impressive. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, he, he broke the track record, didn't he, as mm -hmm. fast as he was going? Um, you know, which, again, you say, well, my own three, it's, they don't run that race too often. It doesn't matter. They've run it for years and years and years and years, and this horse, you know, broke the track record doing it. Um, and, and doing so five horse field. It was a little bit disappointing that it was scratched down to that, but that's racing. You can only beat the horses that are in the race. And, uh, Charlie Appleby just comes here loaded for bear. I mean, it, it, if you, if you overlook one of his horses running here, um, shame on you because, uh, you almost have to give them a little bit extra oomph when, uh, you know, when you're trying to make your decision on your, on your pick four, pick five, uh, pools, um, Dr. Vankman. Another horse that I really like the name of, um, aside from the Chosen Vron, which I think is a really cute name, um, Dr. Venkman wins the Grade 2 San Diego Handicap, uh, which I thought was a pretty impressive race. A Ghost Sapper Gelding 
that can that can you know show early fractions and and good speed. Um, that's an unusual thing that that you see. You don't see too many ghost sappers that can that can go out and and burn the uh, the, the, the racetrack up the way that he did. Um, I thought that was a really nice victory and a good win. Um, and, and I think that was pretty much it. You, you nailed the other ones, Joe, as far as what other racing, um, you know, America's vow, uh, won in a really weird race, um, on over the weekend at Saratoga, it's not necessarily headline material because it was a, it was basically an A other than, but it was what happened right before they, they sprung the latch, um, a horse, you know, broke through the, the gate, regulatory risk broke through the gate, literally like a nano fraction ahead of when they they sprung the latch and wiped out the three and the two. The three standout sensation was held by the starter because nobody really knew what was going on. Um, and then, you know, this 44 to one shot, America's Vow, went out and just went 24 and two, 49, 114, slowed the pace way down. I think everyone was kind of looking around going, what's going on? Like, is this really a race? Is this, are they going to call it, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a non-starting race? And at the end, um, they ended up saying that the three was a non-starter. The bets were refunded. The four was DQ'd and play and and called unplaced, which I hadn't heard before of of, of an actual standing, but was unplaced. But Joe, you're a better. I'm I'm not. Um, what can what can Naira do, or what can the racing offices do when it comes to a situation like this, where you know a horse all of a sudden becomes a non-starter, and then your monies get put on the favorite? Like, is there anything else that they can do that would be a better option? Because they can't stop the yeah, race I mean, at that point. Yeah, it's a good question, and like, there's been some snafus at Naira that we're going to get to in a little bit. So far this year, this one, I mean, this it didn't seem like this was anybody's fault. Just the horse happened to break through the gate at the wrong time. And yeah, I don't I don't know what else you can do. Like it was the right call to make the three a non-starter because he had no chance. I just feel bad for the connections who trained the horse up to the race, entered the horse in the race. You know, for the betters, you at least get your money back. Uh, and then the most I mean, the only other thing they could do was declare the race a non wagering contest or just, you know, kind of make it a null and void race. But I, if I bet America's valid 44 to one, and I could never have bet that horse, I wouldn't bet that horse with monopoly money. But if I had had that horse at 44 to one, you say the race doesn't count. I would have been pretty pissed off. So I think they, right. you know, relatively speaking, they handled it about as well as they could, but yeah, there's, there's been some other issues yeah. up there at Saratoga and, and at the Naira tracks through the rest of the first half of 2024 that we're going to get to right after this break. Real Talk is sponsored by TaylorMade. TaylorMade is super busy right now with good reason. The yearling sales right around the corner. We kick it. I mean, the yearling sales have already started with Facing July, but the big blockbuster yearling sales right around the corner with the Saratoga Select Sale and then later on Keeneland in September. TaylorMade is going to be have a heavy presence as always in all of those sales. They do, they do the best job in the industry of getting your yearling to market and getting the maximum amount of value for them. I mean, it's just proven. They've been a leading consigner at all the year at pretty much every year yearling sales for years and years now. It's so their family business and they treat the clients like they're part of the Taylor family. I know John has experienced that and appreciates that. Um, they can do all sorts of things. Digital, the digital sales, horses of racing age, brood mares, weanlings, but their, their biggest specialty, I think, is the yearlings. And this is their time to shine. So good luck to everybody at TaylorMade. We appreciate you guys and your sponsorship and we'll be rooting for every single horse that we see from that TaylorMade consignment heading through the ring on Monday. Go ahead, John. And Joe, there's one more thing. I don't, I don't think we, we even mentioned this before, but Physic Tipton is doing a special flash digital sale that ends Thursday afternoon. Taylor Made is represented there with uh, offering a uh, beautiful filly named Ice Cream You Scream, um, who is they're selling a third of it uh, that is owned uh, right now 100 percent by uh, by Little Red Feather, our friends at Little Red Feather, Billy Koch. And um, you can buy a third of the horse. And right now it is sitting at about oh, $180,000 um, for a third of the horse. So you know you're getting a top quality uh, filly, um, residual value up the wazoo. But Taylor May doing a great job of promoting the filly on the Phasic Tipton Digital Flash platform. Those two groups are just married for success when it comes to online sales. As I alluded to in the last segment, there's been some embarrassing egg on the face moments for Naira so far this year. And I'll just go through a, a quick list. Uh, the DQ, the Antonio Venice DQ in April, where it was pretty obvious that they DQ'd the wrong horse and then got up there. The steward got up there and, and basically 
said, no, 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 no. We got it right. If you watch the replay, they DQ'd the wrong horse and mm-hmm. they didn't admit it. Uh, they ran the race at the wrong distance. You remember that? Oh, yeah. In, in like June at Aqueduct, there was supposed to be a five and a half furlong race or a five. I forget which it was. It was supposed to be five or five and a half. They ran it at the other distance. Uh, they, were close. Like, they, they were close enough, though. Yeah, they're only 16th off. So that, that was pretty inexcusable. Um, they've, they've had to scratch multiple horses in the last month or two who were carrying the wrong weight. Seems yep. like that's a kind of a, a problem that, that should not happen in a major racing jurisdiction. And there was one other one on Saturday, and uh, I'll see if we can put up the video, but it was uh, it was early in the card. There was a horse that rushed the gate, basically, and really smashed his head into the gate pretty damn hard and was not backed out of the gate, was not checked by the veterinarian. They opened the gate, and lo and behold, the horse was eased across the wire. Right. So... My question is, where, where, where is the issue? Like, why is there such a quality control issue at Naira, it seems, so far this year? And I don't want this to be like a huge bashing segment of Naira. I think they do a ton of things right. Mm-hmm. You know, the growth of Saratoga and the Saratoga product is very emblematic of a lot of smart people in charge who have been able to maximize their you know, cash cow product and fund the racing for the rest of the year. Cash yeah. less, cash less cow. Cash, cash less cow. Yeah, exactly. But to me, but John, like just simply put, like this is an one of these things you could say is inexcusable to have like a handful of things like this that should never happen in any serious racing circuit. Right. Uh, to me, there has to be like some kind of explanation or some kind of investigation or just some acknowledgement of the amount of pretty inexcusable fuck ups I've seen from at the New York tracks so far this year. Well, I think part of it is that, you know, Naira is on such a, a high stage that when when there are issues, they become national, nationally known and national issues. And and, and that's, you know, that, that's the good and the bad. That's the rub of, of being, you know, a, a year round top quality signal. Um, that's number one. Number two, it was it was uh, somebody came up to me a couple of weeks ago and was complaining about um racing officials and why can't they get better racing officials and some of these guys are too old and they don't know they're not going with the flow they still think they need to type www to get onto the internet you know <laughs> they, for an example um and, and stuff like that and, and 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 somebody else who i was with said where's the pipeline where's the group of people that you would say could step up and be the next fill in the blank racing official steward um, you know, clerk of scales, any anything and, and and everything that that racing, you know, that these racetracks need to have. Um, track superintendent, like where are they getting them from? There's no there's no funnel. There's there's no school of racing um, that that is that is you know developing and and young minds and and getting them ready to take the next step. Basically, all we're doing is is just recycling the same people over and over again from different racetracks and. And, and that's not a good thing either, especially when I don't want people to be scared for their livelihood. But if they know that, like, they could get, you know, pulled and 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 suspended and or fired because of some of these mistakes that they're making, I think they would be a little bit more focused. I mean, one of the reasons why, Joe, I can't speak for you, but one of the reasons why I try to be on for this podcast all the time is I know there are 30 other people that can do it better than I can. Just the general public hasn't figured it out yet. Um, but I know they're knocking on the door all the time. So that's why I need to to make sure that I come up with with thoughtful and entertaining ideas. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Depends on who you ask. Um, but be that as it may, it's not about me for once. It's about, you know, what we're talking about, which is the issues at, at Naira. And, and I don't think that, that, that New York is, um, is the one-off in this cycle. I just think that, that they have the most publicity um, out of the majority of the racetracks. And unfortunately, it's not getting better. It's not like they're, they, they fixed the issue uh, that occurred earlier in the year and it hasn't happened again. No, it's basically just like, whew, we got through 10 races today without somebody screwing up. All right, let's, let's hope that we can do it again this weekend. It's not because they're they're getting better. It's just they're getting luckier. Yeah, well, and I think this is – I'm not an expert in who does what at Naira, but to me, the stewards are the most responsible because I, I just feel like the overseeing of the racing product, the stewards have the most say, especially with the DQs. I mean, that's for damn sure. Like, it, there, there just needs to be a lot more accountability, I think, at all levels – because we're running a product that people are betting tens of millions of dollars on. 
And it just, there's too many, it's too many things like this in racing in general that are screwed up that should obviously be taken care of. But yeah, it's been, a, it's been a rough go for Naira for the last handful of months. And honestly, I think that they need to take a little bit more responsibility for some of the things that have happened. Well, Moving well, Joe, on. And Joe, and, and oh, actually, before oh, we move oh, on, oh, sorry. Oh. Perfect example, the, the race that we brought up with, with the horse, you know, breaking through the gate and, and the DQs and stuff like that. One of the reasons why a 44 to one shot won is because there were three horses in there, all three-year-old fillies that were using this allowance race as a stepping stone for a major grade one at the end of the meet. Well, now basically only one of them went through that race unscathed to the point where you say, okay, that horse deserves to, you know, to be in the starting gate, uh, you know, four weeks from now at the end of the meet, the other ones, like it not only screwed them up for this race, but it may have screwed up the rest of, of the summer career for them. Um, and, and basically effectively blocked them out of, you know, running to their best of abilities in that next race. So as an owner, it would frustrate me to, to all get out that my horses, um, you know, especially because it's a Philly or Phillies in this case, my horse's value were greatly affected because somebody screwed up. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't necessarily want to blame them for that. Like that could have just been a bad luck thing. But again, like you just have to keep the confidence of the betters. And as John mentioned of the owners in the racing product, and there's been too many things that have been, that, that should be givens running the race at the right distance putting the right weight on the horses, not DQing the wrong horse. These should be givens. These We're not asking for the world here. And these are things that they've managed to screw up over the course of the year. So again, I'm, I'm not anti-Naira. Like I think overall they do a great job and they put on a great show, especially at Saratoga. But these, these things that may seem minor, when they stack up like this, you lose a lot of better's confidence in the product and we can't have that. Moving on. To some better news, Heiser released the second quarter facing fatality metrics for 2024. And for the fourth straight quarter, fifth straight quarter, but fourth straight quarter since the uh, the, the implementation of the ADMC program, we've had a decrease in racing fatalities, at least at Heiser, uh, tracks under Heiser's purview. Q3 2023, the number was 1.18 per 1,000 starts. Q4, that dropped to 0.89. Q1 of 2024 dropped to 0.84, and now Q2 of 2024, we're at 0.76. Now, the obvious caveat is that any number above zero, we still got work to do. However, this is a massive amount of progress. This is a 49% decrease year over year. And if you look at the numbers at the non heist tracks, especially in West Virginia, they are way higher. We're talking multiple times higher than these numbers. And I just think about this every time I see, and there was a new one over the weekend. There was a new anti hiso lawsuit over the constitutionality, blah, blah, blah. This, you want to go back to the West Virginia numbers where we have almost three horses breaking down per thousand starts. This over the course of the year equates to hundreds or at least dozens, maybe hundreds of more horses who are still alive and still racing and still enjoying life. Like, this is what makes me so mad about all the people trying to stop this progress from happening because they don't have any other alternative to produce these kind of positive results. Like, where else in the industry are we? Do we have like a, a, a concerted, clear, regimented push to keep the horses safer and keep the horses alive beyond Heisa? We don't have it. So if you're going to if you're going to try to stop this progress, you better have a damn good reason. And it's not it can't be some technicality about constitutionality because none of you give a shit. Like, please stop. Like, it's, it's I'm not saying there's no like legitimate legal argument to make, but that's come on. That's not why that's not why you're suing to stop this. And it just bugs me because this is such an like an overwhelmingly undeniably positive trend for the industry you can talk all you want about the administrative headaches and the bumpy rollout and all this and that look at those numbers and tell me that that's not something to be proud of for the industry i couldn't agree with you more joe on on, on this it, it's it's almost like you have to look at it as 
these are the this is the law of the land and we need to to continue to follow it and now there's actual hard facts and statistics that show that this is working uh you know that that there's less fatalities there's less horses that 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 are in harm's way and and that's really a big part and a big push for what we're trying to accomplish um as an industry i saw it just i think it was this morning or maybe late last night that um highs also is floated a balloon that they want to uh, actually conduct a study on LASIX and whether or not it is performance enhancing. And if it is, or if it's not at what ages does it impact? Because, you know, before Heiser, there was a huge push um, to, you know, getting rid of LASIX for, you know, for certain levels and certain ages. And I don't remember them having scientific proof either way. Um, But it was just like, Hey, this is what we think. Well, now there's statistic facts as to why Heisa is working. Now Heisa wants to do that for LASIX also to basically, you know, once and for all say, is this good or is this not? Is this a de- detriment for, you know, for our horses? Um, and, and, and I think that by including science as opposed to anecdotal, you know, thoughts is, is, you know, the important way to go forward. And science right now is showing that this is a better alternative. Is it a pain in the ass for a lot of people? Yes. Do, you know, do trainers have to add, um, staff or, or, or their own hours into doing bookkeeping and administrative stuff in order to make sure everything's right. Yeah. Are there bumps in the road that, that need to be included? You know, I mean, Joe, I, I heard, I heard a vet and I almost hit him. I, I like, I'm not a violent person, but I almost swung at him because he was, he was not talking to me. He was joking with his owner that, and the owner said, Hey, I think we need to have this horse x-rayed because, um, because it hasn't run in a certain period of time. And in, in accordance with Heisa, we have to have a, a breeze and, and updated uh, you know, medical uh, records for the horse to be able to run. And the guy goes, well, I'll just light up the pony again. We're calling him the nightlight, meaning like they x-rayed the pony in, in, instead of x-raying the right horse and sending those, you know, so, so people are people and they're going to look for ways to skirt around an issue, um, you know, as, as to whether or not, you know, the rules are really taking or not. But for the most part, you're seeing it scientifically that it's showing that, that, that statistically we're going in the right direction. And Joe, I can't speak for you. I can speak for myself. Anecdotally, when I watch races, I'm not seeing the rebreaks at the, at the same level that we were, um, you know, in, in pre Heisa and even in the first couple of months of Heisa. So I think that that it, it's working on a couple different levels. But for, as an owner, I know that when I watch my horse in the race, I'm not going to have to look over my shoulder and worry about is there a Navarro horse that's going to rebreak? Is there a Jason Service horse that's going to rebreak? Is there a, you know, fill in the blank for whomever you want to say, you know, as a better, you know it better than I do. But, but there, there were certain races where you would look and handicap and say, I can't win this race. And I can't win this race because the other trainer is a better chemist than my trainer. Yeah. Well, and that's why I would love to hear, and you do hear it sometimes. I would love to hear more horsemen speak out to that effect. Because it's got to be, I, you know, you're like you're saying it's anecdotal, but I 100% agree. Like, I do not see these insane, like, horse goes 22, 45, going two turns and keeps going and opens up in the stretch, which I used to see a right. lot. Mm-hmm. And you would just, it, it would make you feel hopeless right. because obviously that's not something a horse should naturally be doing. And you would see it fairly frequently. I really don't see it. There's certain trainers whose names I won't mention mm-hmm. who are winning at these giant percentages whose horses now have come back down to earth and are starting to run, you know, more normally what they're, they wouldn't normally be physical, physically capable of. I would love to see the, some of the trainers, the smaller and mid-level trainers who are seeing the benefit of not having to go against the cheaters speak up and say, listen, this is not perfect. Like there are some people who have been caught up in this, who haven't done anything wrong and we should fight to clear their names as hard as possible. But overall, the trend is that fewer horses are breaking down and fewer horses are running off the screen because they're running on something that isn't natural. Like I would love to see more public support because I think the HBPA lawsuits make it seem as if all of the horsemen are against this. And I think most of them are not. Right. So I would just love to, I would love to see like maybe some letter, letters to the editor or whatever saying, look, here's the benefit. Here is here is the, the positive change that this is making. Rail Talk is sponsored by The Green Group, the number one accounting firm in the horse business. No other CPA firm knows the horse industry like they do. Lens offering a complimentary confidential half-hour consultation for listeners of Rail Talk, guaranteeing you'll get value. Call them up at, what's that number, Michael? 732-634-5100. Oh, man. Green Group. 
the dulcet tones of Michael Agresta. Like the, the guy, the guy is just immensely talented. So you can call him up or go to www dot greenco dot com to get your complimentary half hour consultation lens he's he's just he's he's the premier expert in his field of horses and business and the intersection of the two he'll help you make this a more profitable enterprise for you and for anybody in your world that wants to get involved guaranteeing you'll get you'll get find value and savings from his consultation but you don't have to take it from me take it from friend of the show frank taylor I've known Len Green for probably three or four decades. He does my personal accounting and he also does my business accounting. Len's just got a, a, a lot of experience in tax uh, and he really understands uh, that part of the business. But the other thing is, is he, he's a horseman and he understands the ins and out of the horse business and everything, you know. He owns several hundred horses and uh, he's in it every day. So uh, not only does he bring the real uh, knowledge of taxes, but he also brings a deep knowledge of the horse business as well. Appreciate you, Frank, and I'm sure Len appreciates your business, and, and we have a great, great marriage between the Taylor family and the Green family, two, you know, two entities at the top of their game and the top of this game. So once again, Len unequivocally guarantees he'll find you value and savings with that consultation. Call him up at 732-634-5100 or go to www.greenco.com. So there's a lot to look forward to in the next week or so. You know, we used, I had a buddy who always said this, that uh, in summer, June is like the Friday, July is like the Saturday, and August is like the Sunday. It's like a weekend, and we're approaching that Sunday of summer but that doesn't mean there's not still a ton of stuff to look forward to. And we're kicking it off right away this week at Saratoga. Tomorrow, we've got the Glens Falls. Thursday, we've got the Glens Falls Stakes. Nice little field. Friday, we've got the Saratoga Oaks and the Hall of Fame Stakes. Obviously, there'll be also be the Hall of Fame induction on Friday morning. So congr- congrats to all of the inductees. It's always a great, great event if you're in town. And then Saturday is the Whitney Day one of the best racing cards on the calendar and the Whitney came up a very, very competitive race. And you love to see it. You know, we talked about how there really aren't many standouts in the older male division. And this is how the races should be when there are no standouts. Everybody throws their hat in the ring, trying to get ahead in the race for the championship, for the older mayor championship. We've got 12 horses, very wide open race, national treasure for Bob Baffert and the super friends or the Avengers or whatever is the favorite on the morning line at nine to five. And he's, you know, he's a legitimate horse. He ran great in the Met Mile, crushed his his opposition by six and a quarter lengths. Obviously won the Pegasus World Cup earlier this year, just missed beating Cody. Cody's wish in the dirt mile last year, ran a respectable fourth in the Saudi cup. Uh, I think there's too much speed for him. He's drawn inside. There's a lot of other pace. So I think he might get fried a little bit on the front end, but John, there's so many ways to go in this race. Skippy long stocking Arthur's ride. Who's got the best buyer in the field with a 111 last time out going a mile and a quarter in a Saratoga allowance. Uh, he, yeah, Krupe, who's a nice horse. First Mission, who I thought was going to be the leader of the division after his blowout wins in the Essex and the Alasheba, and then he was pretty disappointing in the Stephen Foster. Horses coming from all over the place. John, this is just a fascinating race from a handicapping perspective, if nothing else. From a handicapping standpoint and also from a, a fan standpoint, I mean, when was the last time you remember us getting a full field um, top to bottom of being really nice horses? You know, Joe, we, you mentioned four or five horses in the race. We didn't even mention Charge It who won the last year's Dwyer by 23 lengths, you know, pulling away, almost lapped the field, and uh, and is now coming back off of, this will be his third race from the uh, Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. Um, he's got speed from the 12-hole. Uh, Tumbarumba has speed coming in from from the 8-hole. Long shot's going to be long stocking. You mentioned, you know, Safi Joseph's horses always like to be on the engine. Arthur's Ride, who, if you take out the slop race, uh, put a line through it, um, has really run spectacularly well, the the, the son of Tappet that uh, – uh, from the Mott barn um, first mission you mentioned uh, you know, and, and Krupe just as, as a fan favorite, because he was named after uh, you know, uh, JJ Krupe um, who was a trainer and, and uh, longstanding uh, pin hooker before pin hooking was even, you know, a thing he was kind of uh, at the forefront of that, uh, but national treasure, you know, say what you want about him. He's a talented horse. Certainly um, he ran against some tough horses last year in Cody's wish and Archangelo 
um, and otherwise, you know, would have even more than five and point four million dollars of purse earnings. Uh, but this is the second race off of the Saudi Cup. And uh, and he ran just a, a gangbuster race in the Met uh, race, you know, the grade one. Granted, it was only six horse field and he went out there and kind of just went on the front end and nobody could ever catch him. As a matter of fact, if you watch the horse, um, that in particular is a concern of mine is that he doesn't pass horses. He just doesn't pass horses. Whatever, wherever he is at the half mile pole is pretty much where he finishes. Um, and I don't know if he's going to have the speed, nor do I think, Joe, that that he's going to have the the energy, if he does have the lead at the half mile pole, to be able to pull away from these horses. So it's a great betting race. I think that uh, that there's a lot of good horses in it. And and like you said, this is the uh, this, this is why we're in racing or for races like this. Yeah, and we didn't even mention Bright Future, who was won the Grade One Jockey Club Gold Cup over this track last year, and he had a pretty nice win in the Salvatore Mile, closing into a slow pace and having some traffic trouble last time out. He's five to one. We didn't even mention him. Disarm is going to probably going to be twenty five, thirty to one this race. All he did was run second in the Travers to Arcangelo last year. I mean, there's just so many different ways to go. Warrior Johnny is a horse I'm looking at. He's the four. He ran a monster, monster race on opening day at Saratoga at this meet. Came up the rail, got stopped, came up the rail again and exploded away in the stretch. Second time he's had a blowout win going nine furlongs at Saratoga. He's 20 to one morning line, doesn't need the lead, can just sit in behind the speed. I think he's really interesting. He's I don't think he's going to be 20 to one because mm-hmm. Rigney Racing, that guy always bets his horses. Yeah. He's like, they are, are always open short, but I think eventually he'll drift up and, and he'll probably get lost. And it's just, yeah, it's a terrific race. We'll see coming out of it if we do start to have a little bit more clarity in the older dirt male division because right now it's completely murky and we're looking for a standout maybe national treasure is that standout but i don't want to i don't want to find out at six to five or seven to five yeah exactly elsewhere on the card you got the grade one test um only six horses but a nice little field ways and means coming off of the big blowout allowance win one by eight and a quarter got a 104 buyer that was on belmont stakes weekend is in there probably going to be a pretty prohibitive favorite so we'll see if that race was for real but we had denim and pearls as well who had a huge win in the beaumont earlier this spring emory who's four for five for brad cox just won the victory riot last time out so you do have some quality there the saratoga derby invitational we've got carson's run in that race aiden o'brien's bringing over a nice frankel colt who probably is probably is going to be the favorite and and deservedly so so that's a nice field and then the potentially the fastest horse in the world is also on the card in the grade two Troy Stakes as we're going to see Cogburn try to make it three in a row, 107 buyer, two back, 111 buyer, last time out, ran five furlongs in under a minute. North American stakes record. Can't wait to see what he does again. Yeah, let him roll and and just see how fast he can go. He's going to be a huge favorite. You know, there's some a couple other nice turf sprinters in there, but he, to me, John, he, you know, it's it's it speaks to how awesome he is mm-hmm. that on a race with the Whitney, the Test, the Saratoga Derby, I'm looking forward to seeing him the most. Yeah, I, I could I could definitely see that point, and and you know when when he won that race, uh, the, the Jiper, uh, in in under a minute, that was the race I thought that they put the wrong distance up. I thought maybe they put that one at five for only right. five and a half, <laughs> um, because he just he he almost broke the sound barrier. He was he was so impressive. Now the, this son of not this time, ever since they moved him to the turf, Joe has just found another gear. I mean, he is just you talk about horses for courses and horses that like certain surfaces. Uh, it's not that it's not that Cogburn was was a was a schlub. I mean, he was running and winning and, and placing in grade threes and kind of the undercard races. And then he put him on the turf at Lone Star and he has been basically unbeatable, um, you know, save for a race that he lost at, at Kentucky Downs by three quarters of a length. He has hit the wire first in every single turf sprint that he's run in. Uh, and and they they haven't been easy races. It's not like he looked in the in the turf sprint at Churchill Downs. He was nine to one. Um, in the uh, in in the Chiper with the twelve horse field, Joe, he was still two to one. I mean, he was the favorite, but he was a very cool favorite, which means to mm-hmm. me that there were a lot of good horses in the, in that race uh, in particular. This is a Grade Two, so it's it's technically a step down in 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 accordance with what he ran last time. But as far as as you know, eyeballs on the screen when certain races go, uh, I'm definitely going to be watching the the Troy, which probably has never come out of my mouth other than if we ran a horse in there. It's just, it's just that kind of a must see TV race. And, and again, we go back to the Applebee point of him bringing mischief magic 
um, over overseas. This is the kind of race that he shoots for um, as, as a stepping stone for the Breeders' Cup turf um, you know, championship in, in, in November. So don't fall asleep on the, on the one horse in this race either, but I'm, I'm actually impressed Joe, because you're a better man than I, in a lot of reasons. And, and, and we can sit here for 45 minutes and list those reasons. Um, but it's obvious to the, to the, to the, you know, to the audience, what those reasons are. You have not one, but two horses in the grade one Saratoga Derby invitational with Cugino and Carson's run. And you kind of like glossed over that race. For me, I, that would be the beginning and the end of this conversation of what the important races are this weekend at Saratoga. It's the Saratoga Derby. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a tremendous race. And it's been a it's been a great addition to the calendar. You know, and I, I just I got to say, you know, we were banging on Naira earlier for some of the things that they screwed up earlier this year. They did, They put together a great card on Saturday. The racing office does a tremendous job. And I, you know what else I love? And I want to give them credit for this. They've started putting out these cards and drawing these cards six days in advance. Yeah. There was never any reason why any track had to wait until 20, 48, 72 hours before they drew the cards and put the cards out. This gives people time to handicap, gives people to owners time to plan, you know, if they're going to come see the race. I, that's something I think has been a major positive development at Naira is drawing these cards so early. Yep. And, and, and I'll take full credit for that, Joe, because we started oh, that. We started that, uh, that, 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 that process um, at Gulfstream. The Florida Horsemen started that, uh, you know, over a year and a half ago when we insisted on them drawing a week in advance, um, especially with all the Heiser rules and everything like that. If the horses are going to be off medication and, and, um, and, you know, and, and we need to go through all of the uh, administrative work in order to make sure that they're eligible for, for racing. Um, we wanted to give the trainers and the owners, as you mentioned, as much time as possible to make their plans, make their travel plans. Some people say, well, it gives, it gives people too much time to look at a race and figure out whether or not they're going to run, you know, if they're going to run in it or not. I, I yeah, that, that's probably collateral damage. But in the grand scheme of things, it's much better when everybody has an idea of who's going to be in the race, where they are, and also to make their plans to be able to go and watch the horses run and try to get some enthusiasm. If these races were carted three days before the, you know, be before uh, the weekend, we wouldn't even be able to talk about it on this Wednesday shoot of, of this podcast. We'd have to wait until, you know, the, the, at least Thursday afternoon before we even start talking about it, let alone know what's going on. So I'm glad to see that, that more and more racing offices are falling into line with this advanced five, six, seven day advanced uh, entry day. Um, Cause I think it gives, it gives people a little bit more to talk about. And there's a lot more buzz about some of these better races. Yeah, well, it's 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 a great weekend because, as we said, it leads into the Facing Saratoga sale. Yeah. So it's a really tremendous, like, four or five days of racing and sales and just the best of Saratoga. We can't wait for it. So in a show that I ranted and raved about the quality control at Naira, if you'll notice, this, <laughs> this background <laughs> was upside down for most of the show. So I guess the lesson here is nobody's perfect. But seriously, can we run the races at the right distance and all that stuff? The person who's supposed to be in charge of quality control on this show, Patty Wolf, our intrepid producer, is probably a little distracted for several reasons. But her big her birthday is coming up. That might be one of the reasons she's having her big. Am I allowed to say 60th birthday coming up on Saturday? Whitney Day. We love you. We wish we could be there to celebrate with you. And we brought on all of our friends to wish you a very happy birthday. Nathan! Happy birthday! Oh, hello! Hey, Nathan! Who are you birthday? This is for you, Patty. For you, Patricia. Oh, no, my birthday's Saturday. I know, know that, but, but we We're know putting that. putting it in the but show, still. baby. Yeah, just in, case you, just in case you don't make it. Stop! <laughs> it's the worst birthday. <laughs> message look at you you're you're like you're like flush in color and and you're like glowing and and you're you're um what's the word i'm looking for you're for swollen. look look at <laughs> swollen, <laughs> swollen with pride <laughs> those, those bee stings did your skin some wonders exactly. <laughs> it does look exactly that, that's like gonna be the baby, next fad a baby's bottom i don't know what you're using out of this let's not do it <laughs> one two three Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday to you. you. Project folks. Happy, happy birthday, dear Patty. Happy birthday to you. You. From the 
least synchronized, most tone deaf <laughs> group ever. Yeah, that was the worst I've ever heard. And by the way, Julie is a professional singer, so it hurt my soul. Off key, but full of love. That's right. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Patricia. Happy birthday to our leader. We I love can't you. wait for all your gifts to arrive. I'll be waiting at the door. I, I sent you honeybees. Stop it. <laughs> a box of hornets anyway this was Good, meant to be a heartfelt happy birthday we love you it is Thank right you. it is but this is more on brand <laughs> thank you guys i we appreciate love you it. patty love you thank you love all you guys you make me laugh every week we hope you make it another 60 years oh all the by, by the way i forgot it was your 60th you know what this means you're now eligible to be the next golden bachelorette <gasps> Wow, Ooh. now that's wow. an interesting idea. Mm. That is this is happening. my dream for you. Mm, birthday, you have. Mm. Good luck editing this little thing. All right, so that's going to do it for episode 54 of Rail Talk. Thank you to John Green. I guess you were my guest today. Always appreciate having you in the studio. Shout out to our producer, Patty Wolf, the birthday girl on Saturday. If you see her on social media or out and about in Connecticut for some reason, make sure to wish her a happy birthday. She deserves all the love in the world. Thank you to our producer, our associate producers, Julia Agresta and Nathan Wilkinson. Shout out to you, the viewers and the listeners for tuning in. And we'll see you back here for another jam-packed episode of Rail Talk next week.